What's up, guys, and welcome back to Paint Bravely, the podcast where you can find a little bit of encouragement, discover new ways to make your hobby more fun, and most importantly, learn to paint bravely. Now, today we have some, uh, I don't want to say contentious topics, but we are going to be talking about some of our more unpopular opinions that have to do with the hobby in general. So we'll get into that in a minute. But for now, Brent, what have you been up to since the last time we talked? Okay, I've been up to some unpopular things, and we're going to get to that. That's all going to tie in real nicely. <laughs> really uh, but we'll, yeah. start, we'll start calm and happy. Um, let's mm. see here. I am on Hobby Streak Day 27 as of this recording. So this is doing something related to the hobby every day and posting that up on Twitter. And just a little, little yeah. hashtag, Hobby Streak Day, whatever. Post a picture that that uh, proves that you did something related to the hobby, and that's uh, a little bit of accountability. I'm hoping that Are you finding that pretty useful. I actually am. Yeah, like I I think that I am getting more stuff done because at the back of my head it's like, well, I gotta I gotta get something to post up on there. Mm -hmm. I've had a couple of I don't know, not cheat days, but like a little bit uh, less <laughs> accomplishment than others. Um, you know, over the last week or so, I spent a couple of days playing a lot of Galactic Civilizations 3, which is, I don't know, civilizations in space. You start on Earth with a yeah. colony ship and a scout ship, and you gotta, you gotta go out and colonize and fight the, fight the aliens and take over the aliens. It's, 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 it pulls you in, it pulls you in. So yeah. on one of those days, uh, luckily in the background while I was sitting in front of my computer playing Galactic Civilizations 3, my cats were also sleeping very cute on the bed. So I set up a camera, you know, I got a couple hours of B-roll footage of them just spooning. And, you know, that was my hobby streak progress. I got some B-roll footage yeah. of some cats. You know I'm going to use that footage. You know, maybe I'll yep. put it up on <laughs> Goobertown Hobbies YouTube channel. Maybe I'll put it up on Goobertown cats youtube channel mm -hmm. now i've recently been outed as having a secret separate channel uh called goober town cats which i haven't mm -hmm. actually posted anything on for a year and a half now but maybe the time has come people are starting to really get interested yeah. in this uh goober town cats channel and who knows maybe maybe someday that'll be the big one you know i mean cats and youtube that's a long good history yeah, I could see that. I mean, once you start live streaming, oh yeah, oh yeah. Now, nah, for for real though, the the hobby streak thing, the uh, you know, the motivation to do something with your hobby every day, to have some accountability to yourself, and assuming that the internet cares, uh, at, at least they can check <laughs> your Twitter feed and see if you've been posting something every day. If somebody does care, but. You care, mm -hmm. you'll know, and you'll get yeah. stuff done. Uh, most of the days I actually have been posting, like, this is the model I've been working on today. And a lot of them are, you know, work in progress pictures of the same model day after day, but it's getting better day after day. And I don't care about Twitter, so I don't care that I'm, you know, screwing up my feed with a bunch of terrible uh, work in progress shots. So, yeah, I think well Twitter's that well. a little different in that regard like you can just kind of post whatever i mean you know you could live tweet watching the newest mandalorian episode and and people would be interested you know like it, it doesn't overfill your feed so much i suppose like instagram right right and we've we've had this chat before but Mm -hmm. I care marginally more about Instagram than Twitter, so we'll fill up that Twitter feed with Hobby Streak, and there you go. And my intention mm -hmm. is to keep on going with this as long as possible. Uh, you know, maybe maybe we'll have some little cheats in there, but I think mostly I'll, I'll keep on getting more work done. And, you know, actually yeah. I have been, I think I have noticeably been making more progress on, on my hobby and, you know, getting models painted, so all good, all good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think it's pretty cool that um, it's like you can extend a lot of the things that you're doing that revolve around the hobby and kind of include that in there, too. So 
yeah, taking B-roll of your cats or, you know, cleaning your hobby space or reorganizing something or, you know, refinishing a desk even, right? Mm -hmm. Like you, you can include all that stuff. So I think that's pretty cool. Yeah, I think that's that's probably the the biggest thing, you know, for people that want to do that is that th there's a lot more stuff that goes into our hobby than just straight up painting all the time. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But then, you know, if you are on your third day of posting, I kept organizing my desk, maybe on day <laughs> four, you're actually going to paint something. You know, maybe that's a little a little way to keep you informed of what you've been doing and remind mm -hmm. you that you haven't painted anything in four days so maybe today's the day yeah i think i'd probably be feeling it after the maybe the second day just Good. going uh i don't think i can uh i don't think i can post another cleanup you know progress exactly. shot or something exactly <laughs> yeah yeah so i promise that my weekly update will not always be my hobby streak but i'm pretty proud that it's been going for nearly a month now and hopefully that keeps on going yeah. All right, give me an update, yeah. Casey. What's new with you? Oh, man. Well, I painted that rogue trader, or a rogue trader, I suppose. Um, and that was pretty cool. I've never, uh, it's from, the, what is it, Blackstone Fortress Warhammer box set. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, like I saw the model on eBay, and it was, I think it was 20 bucks, which is like way more than I would pay for a model normally. But it was just so cool that I, I kind of just went for it. <laughs> um, but yeah, now I want to get my hands on a few more of those because they're pretty unique. I don't know if you've seen the, the Blackstone Fortress models. Yeah, I, I, I'm aware of that set. I haven't paid too close attention to all the models that are in there. But you're not talking yeah, look... three more copies of that uh, Rogue Trader, or, you, or are you? No, no. Okay, her friends. <laughs> you're getting her battles. Good, good, good. Yeah, yeah. If I can find them, they're actually, they seem to be kind of hard to find, but uh, huh. yeah. Um, and then I, I've been working on the uh, Commander Shadow Sun Tau model. Like, uh, somebody sent it to me um, like a year ago. <laughs> And, you know, I was excited about it at the time and then it, you know, things kind of happened and, you know, I just saw it sitting on the shelf in pieces and I thought now is the time, now is the time to do that. So I kind of built this like mini diorama using that model and then I kind of got that like, I don't know, a little bit of an itch and I went on eBay and uh, some other areas and I, I, I bought like $200 in our models. Yeah, it happens. These things happen, Casey, and you can't beat yourself up over it. <laughs> yeah. Now, I didn't pay two hundred dollars. I paid like 80 bucks for all of them. But it's about that amount in actual models. So I feel, feel pretty good about that. Yeah, I met up with a guy locally who was selling uh, a, a couple of different pretty nice town models that like he poorly assembled. And then one of them was broken, but it's like, you know, sheared off at the ankle kind of thing. Um, but some of the bigger mechs or like the suits or whatever. I don't even know what they're called yet. I have no idea about Tau. It's all but letters and numbers, to man. Jump in, right? Letters and numbers, <laughs> battle suits. 86 yeah. and battle suits. Yeah. So, yeah, I've got uh, a little battle force going on. Um, and then, of course, the uh, Warhammer community page just announced that they're they're doing, you know, the Christmas boxes like they usually do. And one of them is a very large Tau box. <laughs> so, yeah. So you could buy another $200 worth of Tau? Is that what you're telling Literally, me? yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> That's going to happen. <laughs> like, I, it's weird. Like, I've, I've built and painted more 40K this year and haven't played 40K in, like, 23 years. <laughs> yeah. You need this. You deserve this. Merry Christmas, buddy. I deserve this, yes. <laughs> if only. <laughs> Make sure to check out Casey's Patreon page. He is going to buy a Tau Battle Force box, and that's not cheap. That's also not getting painted on the channel. <laughs> <laughs> but if you buy it on e eBay, you can normally get a discount, you know? Well, and, and I do actually, that's, that's something to note. So they, they're like, 
what, 189 from Games Workshop, then you get like a 20% discount, whatever, at a, at a normal store. Um, if you buy it on eBay and from a store, you can usually get like a 30%, sometimes a little more, depending on how competitive the stores are getting between each other. Um, so I would absolutely recommend going on eBay, finding a brick and mortar store in where, you know, wherever, um, and throwing them some cash for a box. Uh, the last one I got, the, the Karad, Karadron Overlords Christmas box, like two years ago, I paid mm-hmm. 150 for. So, yeah. yeah, you can definitely get them for a lot cheaper. Yeah. Yeah, every once in a while, I don't know if eBay still does this, but they used to even do like 10% off toys and games uh, mm-hmm. categories and stuff like that. Like eBay was subsidizing sales. Mm -hmm. of just ebay itself would give you a discount code off buying something from you know a third party and i don't understand how that worked except for ebay literally subsidizing uh, a discount on Mm -hmm. that stuff but yeah yeah i I, I bought a seraphon battle force with that yeah yeah there you go yeah that that is a thing and i i don't actually i wish i knew the timing on that because that comes up every so many months in that specific category i don't know how often but that is a thing i would yeah. maybe should have talked about in there in our ebay episode but yeah, whatever yeah well we're getting to it now and that's the important thing yeah exactly. my my main microphone and mixer setup i got like a with 10 percent off on an ebay sale and then mm-hmm. you know that seraphon battle box i think i got 15 percent off in addition to whatever the third party retailer was doing for a discount so i was pretty pleased with myself on that one so merry yeah. christmas for everybody yes for a, yeah <laughs> and a happy two years later when i still haven't assembled anything from that box literally yeah <laughs> like mm-hmm. I, mm-hmm. I bought i think three of those boxes and i've maybe assembled like i don't know 15 models out of those three boxes yeah, it's not, as you do it's not great yeah, uh, yeah as you do yeah exactly well, I got a good yeah, feeling about but, this uh, year, though. Yeah. Yeah, it should be good. Uh, I definitely want to try and play 40K at some point. Like, I have a feeling that I'll probably end up flying somewhere and playing with some random person before I actually playing, I don't know, locally. It's weird to say that, but it just seems like a thing. Hey, you've got a lot of internet friends, Casey, who would love to play 40K with you, so... Exactly. Fly to, <laughs> fly to any city and get a match. Yeah, that's true. I was, I was offered a match a few months ago. Uh, well, I shouldn't say a few months ago. It was right before lockdown um, up in Oregon. And I was actually going to be up in Oregon, and I was really excited about that. And then, uh, yeah, yeah, it all all fell apart. So anyways. Anyways. Got any more awesome updates? Oh, I've got a few. Let's go with a happy one. Um, So I've been painting some some Jazzamarines from his Mega Minis art box. Yeah. And they're coming along really nicely. I've got a nice yellow going on. I've got the shading and the highlights. I'm, Mm. I'm excited to show those off. And I even was able to get Jazza to send over a couple of minutes of him talking in front of a green screen, which I'll, I'll try to edit so that Jazza's, <laughs> you know, talking uh, in my little workshop here. Yes. And, and I asked awesome. him, you know, hey, can you, can you send me like a 30 seconds of, of intro or something for this video? And the first thing he says is, do you want it in front of a green screen? I'm like, uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's an option. I mean, option. that's just yeah, asking that's... for it, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, for anyone who doesn't know, Jazza is a, a big art YouTuber, one of the largest art YouTubers, maybe the largest, I don't know. Um, but he's, yeah, he's up there. He's up there. The largest legitimate ones. Okay. Okay. Yeah. He's got, he's got more than 5 million subscribers and he gets a ton of views on every video, but he has recently gotten into or back into mini painting. And I think that's just an awesome thing for our hobby. The more people with, the more people with reach who are talking about painting minis and are showing it off and are creating their own minis and art boxes and getting them out into the world, that's all a very good thing. So Mm -hmm. 
it's all good right there. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah, and that, that pack he has of their their resin models, right? They are. Yep. They look nice. They are nice. Yeah. Yeah, there's um a few spots where I don't know, there's like a little bit of a meh, I don't know if what the word is for it actually. It's not a it's not a mold slip, but there's a few places where there's like a a flat surface isn't totally f- flat. There's like a weird kind of hmm. I should look up the the name for that type of particular type of defect. Uh, there's a few little spots that needed to be cleaned up, but they're on the whole they're great designs. They're nice, um, mm-hmm. they're nice models, and they had a ton of uh, modularity to them too. There's a bunch of different head options, a bunch of different weapon options, and yeah. Did I had you paint a, a, the uh, the Jazz ahead? Yes, yes. <laughs> um, I've I've got them over here. I'm reaching over right now, picking up my jazz marines. Uh, so the marine with the jazz ahead has like a samurai banner on his back, and he has a big thumbs up, and he has a sword in one hand. So that's my my jazz marine. But yeah, they had um, tons of different weapon options from across like all genres, basically. So I have like a mm-hmm. a power armor samurai with a samurai sword, and also like a I don't know, a, a handgun like held, held all <laughs> sideways and it's pretty mm-hmm. sweet. Yeah. My, that sounds uh, sweet. <laughs> yeah. Power armor Yakuza is it's awesome. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's cool. But uh more on that later. So that's that's the rest of my good news, Casey. I like it. It's good news. All right. So the topic of today is unpopular <laughs> opinions that we have. And mm-hmm. recently I was called out on a video for an unpopular opinion of mine. So uh, in mm-hmm. some good news, our friend Danny has a Kickstarter going. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And he's, uh, what's it called? The <clears throat> Lost, Lost Adventures, Adventures Volume, Volume 2. Two. Oh, yes. yes. Tons of 3D printable little uh, NPCs for your D&D games. Yeah. So I picked out like the cutest that he had. I said, Danny, you know. Show me what's in this set. I picked out two of my favorites. I picked out a little cat fisherman, and I picked out a turtle folk, I don't know, druid. She's got a dragonfly. Really cute. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And you know, with a, with any video, it's like, okay, how do we, how do we make the video cool? What's what's going to be special about this video? Right. How do you frame these models to make them more than models? Right. So the first instinct I had with these is these are both like seaside models so maybe i can learn how to do a resin pour and make a really cool water effect yeah and i thought about that and and i have some resin around here but i'm just not confident with my resin skills uh or it's actually not even resin epoxy sorry the epoxy Mm -hmm. pour and i was not confident with my skills so i'm like yeah i'm actually more confident just putting a real fish in the scene so I like that. That's a good idea. Thank you, Casey. You're you're easing my nerves a little bit here. I'm uh, trying. It is it is a good idea. It is a good idea. So what I did is I went and I went online and I bought the the smallest glass vase that I could. So a rectangular mm-hmm. glass vase, essentially the tiniest fish tank imaginable. It's like right. eight inches by four by four. I did the calculations, it's like 0.6 gallons it is a very small tank okay and then i went to the fish store and put a beta in there and mm. then i made a video of you know there's the beta swimming in his tiny fish tank and on top i have a, a bamboo pier and i have the figures from the kickstarter nice little turtle nice little cat fisherman sitting on the bamboo pier and bubbles the beta swimming around beneath it was quite glorious. Now, tell me about the comment se- section on that video, Casey. <laughs> okay. So, I watched this video. I thought it was really cool. Um, I don't know much about fish, but I know that... I mean, just from my perspective, right? Betas come in a small container. And the things that I know about them are that you put them in a, a slightly larger container than what they come in, and you have a cool little fish. Now, in the comment section of this video, 
which you should watch because it's a good video. People were, um, they were a little upset, Brent, at your unfair Inhumane. torture prison. <laughs> yes. Abusive. Inhumane, abusive. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, yeah, basically calling you out mm. on your, your care of fish, fishes, the little fishies. And uh, yeah, apparently uh, that tank needed to be at least 20 gallons bigger and uh, needed, needed stuff inside of it and a nitrogen filter and some kind of oxygen thing and then something else on top to not scare the fishes. Or maybe it was to take something off the top. I don't even know. Yeah, basically, you got attacked. Now, they weren't all wrong. Now, I actually agree right. with a lot of what those comments said. But, right. yeah, I was, I was blindsided by that. And I went back and I watched my video. And I was like, okay, I see where they're coming from. I see, I see what I did wrong here. Um, mm -hmm. So the rest of this story, the shirt I'm wearing today is my uh, uniform from the place I worked from age 16 through age 19, Aquatic Concepts, uh, a fish store, a tropical fish store, an aquarium store. And mm -hmm. so when the comments in that video said, you don't know what you're talking about, those are the ones I do disagree with. Now, I'll admit I did not fully uh, demonstrate that I knew what I was talking about in the video. I, I, uh, okay. I really spent a lot more time on the painting than I did on the fish set setup, which was, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that, that was not wise of me. I should have picked my words more carefully, uh, put, put some more caveats and uh, explanations in there. But... Um, <sighs> Yeah, so we, uh, a beta or, or Siamese fighting fish or whatnot is a tropical fish, which means uh, depending on where you look, anywhere between 75 to 78 degrees Fahrenheit and room temperature is not that. And so if you put them in a small container, it's a bit chilly for them. I mean, they're cold-blooded creatures. They'll, they'll be all right, but it, it's not optimal. Um, mm -hmm. They are also fish that uh, they have a labyrinth organ. They can breathe oxygen directly for, from the air without having to go through the whole gills apparatus. Actually, I'm not exactly sure how that all works, but they don't need to be swimming around as much as other fish do in oxygenated water. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they're, they're actually better suited than most fish to a small space without uh, oxygenation bubbles. Uh, water movement um, and it's basically accepted in the industry that it's okay to sell one of these fish to a child in a pretty small container and oh, like uh, be kind of morally okay with that mm -hmm. so yeah and, and anyway the, like this whole experience got me thinking like wow um I am normally on the other side of conversations about animal cruelty and abusive animals and all that. So it's like, huh, how did I end up on this side? And so I did give it some serious thought. Mm -hmm. And I came up with two explanations. So okay. hit me. Okay. The first is just uh, being habituated hab what's the word sensitized desensitized that's the word habitually desensitized yes i have been desensitized to okay. fish death <laughs> okay so sure. uh as part of working at an aquarium store one of the tasks is to do a dead pull and so what what right. that is is uh you you come into work turn on all the lights before you unlock the door for the customers, you walk around and you pull the dead fish out of every tank. Makes sense. There's normally a lot. Like, like this is something that's not super common knowledge, but there's a lot. Um, really? Oh, yeah. What, what kind of percentage are you talking here? Like, per tank? Oh, oh I mean, not that bad, but like, um, maybe <laughs> store-wide, like... 
one two percent like it's okay. which which in a store with let's say a thousand fish that's that's a 10 fish 20 yeah. fish like it's it's a good yeah. number mm -hmm. um and then i should back up and even further and say like i actually worked at a good pet store uh we mm -hmm. like required customers to bring in water samples so that we'd run like a full bank of tests on them before we would sell them fish um, we would very commonly refuse to sell people fish based on the water that they brought in. Or if they didn't bring water in, we'd say, okay, we'll sell you a fish, but um, no warranty or whatever. Like, Right, okay. Yeah, you know. Yeah, normally it's not, not Petco. Right. So, and, and not that every Petco is bad. I'm sure plenty of employees who work at Petco love their fish and know what they're doing. Sure. Um but on the other hand, if the employee at Petco gets offered an extra two dollars an hour to flip burgers, yeah, you never know. Like, <laughs> um, yeah, more more that I mean that uh, Petco is a chain, right? Whereas like the shop you worked in was a standalone specialty shop. Like, yeah, well, yeah. in in some yeah. ways, like a like a hobby store. I mean, it, yes, a hobby store. Mm -hmm. Um, and I mean, yeah. you know, whereas yeah. like a Petco you know, just uh, corporate may send them a certain number of tetras every week and a certain number of betas every week. Mm -hmm. um, you know, at, at a small local fish store every week, they order how many they want of each fish and they don't have to be, you know, artificially pushing fish or having fish get overcrowded and dying because of that. And, um, mm -hmm. So we actually worked at a pretty uh, respectable fish store as far as these things go. Uh, a, a store that really did care about the the well-being of fish and everything um and yet part of just working in in any fish store it's like wow uh a lot of fish die <laughs> um right <laughs> and you know one of my responsibilities was actually to pick up shipments of fish at the airport so you there's hmm. a distributor you order the fish every week um i think there was a couple distributors actually but you know one or two days a week you get a call from the airport your flight is in you've got four boxes of fish here so um you know, i got in my 98 sob 900 and uh right right uh red had the had the ignition down in the center console is pretty cool uh was it a diesel <laughs> no you're thinking of like a mercedes or something right like oh sobs come in diesels i'm pretty sure in fact, I, I almost bought one a long time ago. Sobs don't, don't exist I, anymore. I thought I wanted a rally car, so, you know, sob made sense. <laughs> Look, um, so 17-year-old Brent drives over in his 98 Saab. He's got mm -hmm. uh, Rammstein playing, um, and that's part of the acclimation process. And load up the fish in there, and then take them back to the shop, and then you crack open these big boxes of all these bagged-up fish, and a lot of the fish in those bags are dead. Um, mm -hmm. you know, shipping fish across the country comes with a certain casualty rate. Uh, normally mm -hmm. that's like mm -hmm. 5 or 10%, and it's just a very systematic oh, wow. thing of you write down the casualties, and then the, the distributor gives you a, a credit for your next order sort of thing. Right. Okay, so that's that's reason one. Just, just one... A, desensitized towards fish death so so what you're saying is is the tank you put it in you know it's gonna live you know most likely it's fine so that's the tank you decided to put it in to start with and it was fine you're not necessarily thinking about well, the so, longevity so the, my, my first point is just that um as much as i love fish I've also seen enough dead fish to, uh, I, I guess there, I, I don't have, I admit that I don't have the humanity that some people have towards these creatures, right. uh, because I have done enough dead poles in my life. Um, right. and the, the other part of this is really the experience of being someone working in retail and, mm -hmm. So this job was the only time I've ever worked retail in my life, if that's what you want to call it. You know, I worked a cash register. I dealt with customers all day. Yeah. Um, and it is 
was like a really fun experience of the the fish people you know coming in to mm -hmm. tell you about their tank and tell you what they want to do and you know what have you got in stock today and this is what i want to put in there and can i get this with this and can i put this in this type of tank and how would you improve the lighting on this tank like it was it was a lot of fun um but there were certainly were subtypes of customers so you had yeah. your you got your cichlid people you got your discus people your goldfish people you, you salt water people you know within that fish only reef only you got mm -hmm. a lot of types but one of the types is small child who wants their first fish yeah and i worked at this place during the year that finding nemo came out oh boy mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> so it was it was very common for people to be like oh brent don't you don't you like fit you like fish right do you like that movie finding nemo no that is the worst movie uh in <laughs> <laughs> uh, the How the change you, <laughs> in the the politeness of little kids before and after that movie changed a lot that makes sense yeah um but no it, it was just like a daily thing of of a you know a cute little four-year-old coming in and and seeing the reef aquarium and then bam 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 look mommy <laughs> nemo nemo look mommy bam 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 <sighs> um you know, it's, and then it's dumb go, bam, because bam, in bam. that movie that happened and it's like, that's the kid that you're not supposed to be like. That was the point in that movie. Like that little girl was a terrible little girl. Yeah. Anyways, the movie wasn't even about Nemo. It was about like Marlon, right? Like it was. Yeah, <laughs> literally. <laughs> uh, but, the, but then and then they go, bam, bam, bam. Look, mommy, it's it's Dory. It's Dory. And then I'll be like, oh, that's not even a Dory fish. That's a, it's a damsel fish. You're pointing to, you know, uh, <laughs> Dory fish are actually reasonably rare in this hobby. But you're pointing at something else entirely different, kid. Like, um, but anyway, part of, you know, working in retail is the the first time pet owner, someone who has never had any pet before. Often it's a kid, uh, you know, with a parent and they come in and they say, I want a clownfish. And you say, okay, um, normally this is the setup we recommend for a clownfish. It's saltwater tank. You need some live rock. You need the, you know, this type of filter. Um, you can get away without a protein skimmer, but like you're, you're looking at four or $500 to, to get set up here. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, the mother starts explaining like, oh, I'm sorry, Billy, like there's no way we can, we can afford this. Like, <laughs> no, no, not even if we combined birthday and Christmas, like, I, I'm sorry, right. Billy. <laughs> um, and, and then, you know, you as the pet store employee can say, you know, that salt water, like there's a little bit more expense there because uh, it's more common to have like live rock with the salt water tank, but you can get a, a freshwater tank for I don't know, maybe half that, a couple hundred. You cut out the price of that live rock. Um, and they're still like, no, no, we can't do it. Um, but then you say, okay, we have this deal here. It's $20 mm -hmm. for a beta, a one-gallon bowl, a little bit of gravel. Uh, you got a little bit of food and some dechlorinator. 20 bucks? 20 bucks. First yeah. push. <laughs> and that entry level pet um mm -hmm. and this is this is where i get my lifelong justification for it is okay to sometimes have a beta in a small container um the there is a need like a partially it's a, a marketing or commercial need for an entry level pet but partially it's yeah. Uh, or like a real societal need, uh, mm -hmm. a, a human need for for an entry level pet, and you know, betas. Yes, betas would rather be in a heated tank, in a larger tank with more room to swim, with more stable water chemistry. Yes, I know all about the nitrogen cycle, and you got your ammonia and your nitrites and your nitrates, um, but. I truly believe that there is a need to be able to say to that little kid, yes, you can take home a fish. Yes, you can have your first pet today. And that fish, like betas actually are, of all the 
water creatures out there, they're actually reasonably well suited to this. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's better to have a full tank, but they'll live a good long time and uh, Billy will be happy. And Billy may come back in a couple years and buy a real tank and be in the hobby forever. Um, so yeah, that's, that's where I'm coming at from that. Yeah. So yeah, in my life I have, uh, you know, many times said, all right, all right, little guy, these are our betas. No, no Nemo for you. Uh, you will definitely <laughs> right. kill Nemo, but, uh, you won't kill this beta. Like that's, it, it'll be all right. He's, yeah. he's cool too. And of course, you know, like from a commercial standpoint, of course, we try to upsell them to a full tank. That's a that's sure. A, yeah, that's that's your job. <laughs> it is. It's better for the fish. It's better for uh, you know the owner of the fish because it's easier to take care of that full tank. You know, the the more water in there, the the slower the various parameters change. Um, but if we can't convince them to buy you know a hundred dollar tank. Twenty dollars for a big bowl and a beta and some food, uh, and then maybe they'll maybe they'll stay in the hobby and their you know their parents won't get angry and leave the store and never come back and never let <laughs> Billy into another pet store again. You know, <laughs> right? <laughs> um. So yeah, that's that's basically where I was coming at with that. Like, right? I was I was making a video. I was like, all right, let's get a fish in this video. And uh, for anyone interested, uh, immediately after I was done filming that video, I put bubbles into a fifteen gallon tank because that's what I had in my basement. Mm -hmm. um, but we'll uh, throw a picture up. Sure. Yeah. Look at that. Look at that crispy fifteen gallon tank. That's nice. Yeah. And in the tiny tank, little bubbles just sat in the corner and did nothing. And in the big big tank, occasionally he swims to like the other corner and sits there and does <laughs> nothing. But <laughs> but right. but I am legitimately happy that I'm able to get a, a heater into his larger tank and, and keep it at that mm -hmm. that nice seventy six degrees Fahrenheit where it's supposed to be. Yeah, yeah. Now the thing is, <clears throat> you know, you, you started off by saying like Maybe you didn't do your uh, your due diligence in explaining this in your video. Now, when I watched it, you had mentioned that you worked at, you know, the the aqua. What is it called? <laughs> uh, aquatic concepts in Westbrook, Maine. Aquatic Bain. concept. Yes, like you you did say that, right? You said, "Hey, I've I've taken care of fish. I have this clownfish that I've had for a long time." Like you basically dropped your knowledge on I can keep a fish alive within the first I'd say yeah. uh, a minute yeah right? I, I should have mentioned that uh I purposely bought the smallest glass container I could find so that it would make a nice thumbnail with the uh the figures the fish and the aquarium like I, I should have mentioned that I purposely went you like really did say that yeah look we we've been making <laughs> videos for a little while now we know how to play defense with like the obvious criticism yes. we're gonna take yes uh, I did not play defense and uh, you, explain. You didn't what I entirely, explained. but I, I think at this point, and maybe maybe I'm just being hopeful of the internet, but I I think that when you present yourself as a hobbyist with a PhD, and you say I've taken care of fish before, and this is going to look really good for the thumbnail, and I literally have another tank. That should be more than enough for people, but I mean, it's not obviously. Yeah, but I, I, I do think that there's I a put line the inflections of inflections on like the wrong words and stuff. Like I, I went back and I looked and I did say, okay, I see where they're coming from. I, I get it. Like I'm, um, yeah. and I'm actually glad that these people are are out there, the ones that are concerned with the the safety of that fish. Sure. Um, and I do think that after Billy has his first beta, the next step should be for like a real tank. And maybe some more fish. Um, I don't think the next step for Billy should be ten more betas and tiny little enclosures. Like that's <laughs> right. That is certainly not or what I'm advocating for. You see for the here, uh, the double tank where you put one on each side and there's a pane of glass in the middle. That's a thing you can buy. Yeah, saying who's and more irresponsible here. That's all. <laughs> yeah, I mean the industry very much has 
grown to accept and encourage the beta in small tank, which I mean, I mean, on one hand, it's like, oh man, those some of those beta tanks they sell are really small, and that's that's not that's not great. Um, but then I I absolutely appreciate that you need that that price point, that entry level pet, that um, that thing that you can, you know, here Billy, like this beta isn't gonna have as as good a life as the beta that gets the twenty gallon tank, but. He's gonna he's gonna leave a you know reasonably happy life there, and he's uh, more importantly serving a purpose. And harsh mm-hmm. truth is, us humans consume animals in various ways. Uh, we consume cute little creatures in our in our paintbrushes, you know. Um, mm-hmm. I eat chicken almost every day. the The amount of chicken I go through in a year is uh, <laughs> frightening. Uh, if you're a chicken um yeah yeah that's true but those chickens are serving a purpose and betas are serving a purpose too and and, yeah they got the short end of the stick in a way you know they're a little bit yeah most tetras most tetras at least get a five ten gallon tank but but people say (laughs) beta yeah throw that gas that's true like uh i think that the I don't know, the marketing and branding surrounding betas is cheap, easy to take care of. Don't have to think about it type of animal. Like that's right. all I've ever thought about. That's like what I've been taught just which is you know, through absorbing that information. Yeah. And that is partially a misconception. Like right, they right. are easier to take care of than many other fish, but because they are slightly easier to take care of, they got put into this category of throw them in a bowl, they'll be fine, don't worry about it. Right, easy, which is, easy mode Which is fish. only half true, yeah. Um, yeah. And in that video, I certainly uh, made it off as if that was more than half true. And uh, yeah, I, I get it, I get it. Um, sure. So, yeah. Casey, before this, before this, we talked and... <laughs> You said, wouldn't it be funny if we just made this entire episode about fish? Uh, I I wanted it to be. And like we we would like imply that we were going to have a future topic coming up, but we just turned it entirely into fish. Mm-hmm. This will be the fish episode. Have you ever had fish, Casey? Um, Actually, yeah. So, well, sort of. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's a way to start. So um, I used to go to my grandparents' house a lot. Right. They live pretty far away from me, a couple hours. Um, but they bought me some goldfish. And uh they had a nice big tank, they had the, the oxygenator and all the stuff. They put stuff in like a bunch of my grandpa took care of them for the most part. I was super young. Um eventually they forgot that they were technically my fish, which doesn't bother me, but um yeah, like I had goldfish at my grandparents' house. And, you know, they were around for a long time. They were like big, fat goldfish, too. Um, so, yeah, you know, kind of had fish in a manner of speaking. Uh, so I do have this. I do have this story. Now. About 13 years ago. When my wife and I were living in our first apartment. We thought it would be kind of cool to get a pet, right? So we didn't have any money. We're both super starving college kids, right? Just going to school, coming home, going to work, whatever, whatever. Um, We decided that we were going to find loose change around the apartment and in our cars. And we found, I think it was like $2.75 or something, $2.75 in change and at like three in the morning we went to a walmart and we thought what can we buy for two dollars and 75 cents in like nickels and dimes and stuff and we wandered around the store for a few hours and we finally made our way into the fish department and i was thinking goldfish are like a quarter at the walmart like, yeah, why don't we buy a fish, right? That sounds that sounds all right. So we couldn't find a fish that was necessarily cheap enough that would also go with a bowl, right? 
They so, get a big gulp from 7-Eleven, you know? <laughs> yeah, that would have been a better idea. But no. <laughs> so Walmart has a glass section where they sell a whole bunch of like super cheap, you know, like for a buck, like cups and bowls and whatever. And we found this kind of little like, I don't know, maybe three inches by three inches kind of compressed fish looking bowl. Right. And next to that, they had some some of those fancy little like glass bead rocks, you know, for like 50 cents or something. We found them on clearance. So we thought we were doing pretty good. You know, like we only had a budget of two seventy five. So that was the plan. Could have wandered around the parking lot for a little while, maybe increase that budget by another dollar <laughs> or so. You're probably but, right. Yeah. 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 But this is this is what we did. Um, we went through the fish section one more time after we got the bowl and the rocks. Uh, picked out some... some... Oh, I'm getting ahead of myself. So they had these little shrimp, right? And they were like 17 cents a piece. And we were already kind of running low on funds and we needed food. We knew we were going to have to get some food. So we finally tracked down a dude and he, he got us out a little shrimp. And I'm talking like the size of a dime, right? It's kind of clear looking. I have no idea what they're for. You probably do. Um, Actually do you? not sold in main fish stores. Really? Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. I think with shrimp. I don't know. Anyways, so we bought this shrimp. And we found some food and we were like under by, you know, four or five cents or whatever. But we're like, you know, feeling pretty triumphant, right? Like we bought a pet. It was pretty awesome. So we filled the bowl with the water, put the little shrimp in there with the little, you know, beads in there. And swimming around and all this stuff is really cool. You know? Um, yeah, we forgot to, uh, to fill it with water. After, you know, a few days, the water oh, yeah. evaporates. Very small bowl. Uh, yeah, so our, our shrimp, Trogdor, that's what we, we named him. He died uh -huh. like, three days later. Uh-huh. Look, yeah. um, uh, viewers, uh, if you're watching on YouTube and you have, you know, already left a comment about how I'm an awful person, <laughs> it's possible to edit your comment and to tell Casey that he's an awful person. That's true. Um, and you if you're listening on your button. phone, uh, be sure to check out this video on YouTube at uh, Paint Bravely, the podcast. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And leave a comment for sure. Uh, rest in peace, Trogdor, the little shrimp. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, we, we threw it the bowl in the trash after. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he dried up. So it's not yeah. like we could flush him or something. Yeah, shrimp need at least one gallon. Need at least three gallons. Need at least five gallons. Need at least ten gallons. Need at least twenty gallons. Everybody Should've had a different gone. number. Yeah, that's that's a good point. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, if I had gone with the twenty gallon, you know, nitrogen enriched with uh, I don't know plants for hiding, I never would have seen that shrimp ever again. Regardless, that's true. It was yeah. too tiny. Yeah, even the glass beads were probably a mistake for seeing that shrimp ever again. Oh yeah, it was hard to actually see him. Yeah. Like you kind of pick out his eyes a little bit, little black like beads. <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> pleading. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. hungry Just and ultimately staring into thirsty. My soul. Yeah. <laughs> I have no idea if it was even. I think they were like food for some other fish or something. You know. Now I've I've heard of these, but um, there really are you know pet laws based on what you can keep in various states and. Everything mm -hmm. is legal in Florida, and in better states, right. less things are legal. Um, but yeah, some of these things are, you know, fear of being an invasive species. And I don't know if that's what it was in sure. this situation, but that's that's a one of the main reasons that we keep so many tropical fish and so few temperate fish is because it's not great to be uh, shipping around invasive species uh, across the country, you know. But, right. <laughs> yeah, so that... that... I don't know. It was an interesting, uh, you know, three or four days owning a fish-like pet. Those goldfish, though, at my grandparents' house, yeah, they, I mean, I'm sure some of them died, but there were always two fish in there. Mm -hmm. Always. Like, for as long as I can remember, so. Very yeah. good. Yeah, I did a good job there.
All right, I think we're ready, Casey. The uh, topic of this video was supposed to be our unpopular opinions. Yeah. So about, uh, you know, partially about fish and fish care, uh, tank mm -hmm, maintenance, mm -hmm. uh, partially about either Warhammer or mini painting in general. Um, painting bravely, you know, fishing right, so bravely. We, yeah, so we, so we really just want to get all these out in one episode so that uh, we'll just put all the negative comments on this episode is what we're trying to do. Right, get them out of the way now. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but like if you've that. already that left fine. a negative comment about beta fish and about shrimp, you can still leave a negative comment about whatever Casey and I are about to say next. Um, oh, I guarantee there will be some things said. But no, these are these are mostly meant to be like fun, kind of hot topics, but just uh, yeah, little yeah. points of disagreement so that Casey and I can actually argue with each other every once in a while and get some 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 dynamics yeah. going. Yeah. Okay. All right. My first one: beta fish need to be in fifty gallon tanks, Brent. Hey, not even anyone from the comments said fifty gallons. Well, I'm but, saying. Uh, Man, the one that called that male beta fish a she and said she needs to be in a larger tank just really showed they knew what they were talking about. Like, <laughs> I actually didn't respond. I didn't respond to any comments on that video, but that one had me close. I got to tell you. like, <laughs> Right. Yeah. The, the one you could come back at and be like, um, excuse me, sir. Uh, uh, we'll just just type he as a response. He, he right. needs to be in a larger a tank. asterisk. You're like, he he currently is yeah asterisk he, he yeah <laughs> that's the way to get him all the right, the we'll uh, asterisk put the right, prince in the proper all right. spot I'm I'm jumping into this hot okay Brent's next Dude, unpopular opinion rebottling paints is silly rebottling Games Workshop paints into dropper bottles <laughs> because you couldn't be bothered to buy a brand that came in dropper bottles already. <laughs> I understand why you feel you have to do it. Like I understand mm -hmm. that the the bottles that GW Paints come in are terrible and like are only good for like a weird marketing thing, but they are terrible and like I understand that you you do need to rebottle them. Um I assert the better solution is to buy a different brand of paint. Many many brands come in bottles. Most brands come in bottles. Um yeah. How do you feel about that, Casey? Well, since I am a decanter of fine Citadel paints myself, um, yeah, I I transfer all of my Games Workshop paints into bottles, and it's for a very specific reason. Okay, uh, first being that I own a crap load of Games Workshop paints. Yeah. And uh, before I owned an airbrush, wasn't really a problem. I didn't have a problem with that. But now that I own an airbrush, I kind of need it to be in dropper bottles. For, you know, quickness. Now, since you yeah. started rebottling GW paints to <laughs> dropper bottles that you had to buy separately. Um, I did. Mm -hmm. Do you do you use a little bit of like flow improver in there or anything when you're doing the transfer? Yeah, that you have to buy separately. Okay, so the the last time that I I did I did my entire collection. I've since gotten a bunch more Games Workshop paints that I haven't done. I bought a hundred bottles, um, for nine dollars on Amazon, and a thirteen bottle thirteen dollar bottle of flow improver. Okay, so 22 bucks, and I did, I th think, 100 paints. Almost all of the bottles were used. Wow, that sounds like a long day, or, or was it like a couple of long days? I did it in one, one sitting. Okay, um, okay. Yeah, but I, was, I was just sitting, like, watching Netflix. I mean, it, it took a while. Like, don't get me wrong. It did take a while. Um, but I don't know. There was something about it, something therapeutic for some weird reason like i know it's it's stupid right um taking the little label off the games workshop bottle and wrapping it back around like perfectly on the new bottle <laughs> like there, there is a nice like satisfaction with that 
So I cannot, I cannot fully agree with you on the uh, don't transfer your paints. I mean, you're a silly man. You're a silly man. <laughs> <laughs> like I can get on board a little bit because uh, honestly, like if you're gonna be using an airbrush and and having paints and stuff, um, to paint models, like go go buy Vallejo paints or something. Like Game Air is pretty good, and it's you just put it right in your freaking airbrush. Yeah. They're already in dry and they're bigger too. Okay. So since the time you did all your rebottling, have you gone out and bought any more GW paints that you've then had to rebottle? Yes. yes. Okay. I, I have, but I have not rebottled them yet. <laughs> they're just sitting over here on a shelf. <laughs> Sounds good. Sounds good. Sounds cool. Yeah. It was cool. People ask me every time I put those in a video, they're just like, oh, what did you do? How did you do that? Like Vince has a video, go watch it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's become like a fairly popular thing. And, and I know a lot of people who have done mm -hmm. this, and it certainly is a more convenient way of having GW paints. But I mean, it man, is. Man, is, yeah. is that a kick in the nads if you spend more money on GW paints? knowing full well that you're going to have to rebottle them because you're spending more money on an inferior product. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's the thing, like the, the price comparison for games workshop and we'll just go with Vallejo. Like mm -hmm. I think Vallejo is like a dollar less per bottle and you get five more milliliters per bottle. Something like that. I, I want to say, yeah, I mean, probably seven or eight by the time you factor in loss from the transfer process. Yeah. You'd be surprised, actually. Okay. Uh, you, you. Oh, I'm just because I'm going to say it. You, you end up getting a little bit more out of it because of the flow improver. Okay. Because okay. you're you're slightly diluting it, and it's it's going a little bit further. So you are filling. Like I think I filled uh, their 15 milliliter bottles that I bought instead of 17s, and they're like filled to the top. You know. Yeah. I mean, actually having those little bottles around is useful for making mixtures, whether that's, mm -hmm. you know, uh, a color mixture or whether that is making your, your special blend of diluted paint for putting through an airbrush or whatever other purpose you want to use it for. Like yeah, going out and, and making that purchase of a hundred little bottles for nine bucks or whatever, mm -hmm. you'll use some of them eventually. Like there are good uses for them for sure, but yeah. Well, I keep I keep wash mixes in them like yeah. Uh, yeah. specifically Reichland Flesh Shade or or even well, not so much the known oil, but Reichland Flesh Shade Gloss. It's a little too glossy. So you 50 50 that with the regular Ooh. and you get like the best like red wash for uh, for like golds and, and stuff. And it's still got a little bit of gloss. It was like 50 50 is where it's at. It's real good. Man, that's going to be a whole episode someday. We're yeah. saving that for later. I'm going to educate myself on gloss versus regular null oil, and we'll we'll really get into it. Gloss no null is garbage. Don't buy it. Okay, well, that settled that. Uh, episode 20 of Paint Bravely, the podcast, is not going to be about gloss null oil. We don't know what it's going to be about yet. but uh, That's probably an unpopular opinion, so we'll just add that to the list anyways. <laughs> next time, next time. All right, give me give me another unpopular opinion. <laughs> All right, let's see here. Uh, Age of Sigmar is a better game than Warhammer 40k. <laughs> and all of Games Workshop skirmish games are better than both of them. Um, I heard that Age of Sigmar is garbage. Age of, and yeah. I hesitate to say it, shitmar. <laughs> now, I like... Okay, yeah, I don't know. I haven't played 40K in like 23 years. <laughs> so I have no idea. As far as I know, though, uh, the rules have been taken into more of that Age of Sigmar territory, and people are mad about that. Personally, and this, this could be added to the list as well, like the dumbification of 40K, like I'm all for that. Okay, like 100% all for that. I know there are a lot of people that aren't. Like it being more like Age of Sigmar makes me want to play it more. But the entry point cost and like 
I don't know, ease of playability time wise and just getting into something like Warcry and probably Kill Team. I haven't done that one. Like Warcry specifically, I have more fun with with the models and playing the game than I have had with like Age of Sigmar or 40k. Yeah, I just think the skirmish games are better. And that Age of Sigmar skirmish game that came out a couple years ago that was, I guess, changed over for Warcry was awesome. So to recap, you are putting 40k at the bottom of all GW games. Correct. I think that's going to be an unpopular opinion there, Casey. Yeah. I mean, I suppose to play devil's advocate to myself, I haven't played all of Warhammer. Like, I haven't played all of Games Workshop's games. But, I mean, I do know that people put, like, uh, Underworlds as, like, the best Games Workshop game. Yeah. Well, we'll talk about that in a second. But, um... Look, I have three copies of Gangs of Kimura uh, in my pile because that's a, a cheap way to get a lot of Hellions and Dark Eldar jet bikes. I have never read the rules of that game. I don't think anybody has ever read the rules of that game, but <laughs> they saw the value there's a lot of Hellions and jet bikes in that set. Yeah. <laughs> Good call. <laughs> yeah, no, GW definitely has some games that are uh, not fully supported that are just there to have a different box of models out. Hey, For that's sure. fine. Yeah. That would be an interesting topic, though, if we figure out if game, Gangs of Kamara is uh, is better is or worse game? than the 40K main. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, if you've got an extra set of rules, just like, uh, ship me a copy and we'll I, I, virtually look, I have, go through it. I have it. three sets of this game, which means I have three extra sets of rules for this game. Like I, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> we, we, should, we should do that. We should figure that out. Yeah. Uh, next episode is going to be us quietly sitting and reading rules and occasionally swearing <laughs> or like yeah. thumbs up if you want to see that <laughs> yeah I've, I've said this a few times i don't know if it's common knowledge on this podcast yet but i hate reading rules and that is you have said that yeah i many many times absolutely <laughs> hate it uh if someone else wants to explain to me the the current version of 40k and and what has changed and that that helps me out I told a lot. You, it's, yeah. It's dumbification into Age of Sigmar, right? Oh yeah. Those those books are so big and they change every 3 years apparently. So, yeah. So I I was I actually forgot to mention this. I went out to a a Warhammer store 2 days ago. Uh and I bought the uh the new bug who is it uh the bugman might be i don't know whatever the christmas model is the limited edition one the it's an overlord's model but it was joseph bugman yeah i'm pretty sure it is um and i also picked up the newest orc 40k codex cuz i figured if i built and painted an orc army i might as well have the book so i know what the hell's in the army because mm -hmm. I literally have no idea. I don't even know if it's a viable army. I think it is, but I don't know. Um, and there's about maybe 10, 15% of the book that's actual, like, useful information. The rest is just awesome pictures and, like, lore explanation, which is cool. But, I mean, it feels like the need for the book is is not what it used to be. Yeah, but I mean, you got to get those pictures of orcs. I do like pictures of orcs. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, in, in terms of like going to a hobby store and support, supporting your local store, uh, like I always have a list of things that are, you know, I could walk out of there with this. Like I always feel like I got to walk out with something and always yeah. like near the bottom of my list is like, if nothing else, I'll buy the codex for the army I supposedly play. Like that's... <laughs> right <laughs> if, I, if I see is. absolutely nothing else i really want to have like i guess i'll get the current codex like yeah it doesn't happen yeah. much like yeah i still spent a hundred dollars and we were in there for like 15 minutes good good <laughs> yeah Doing i mean it's part? it's one of those things yeah a lot of local people go to that store so gotta gotta support yeah so hit me with another Super unpopular opinion. 
Okay. I think I think this one might strike some nerves. Measuring <laughs> okay. sticks are fundamentally incompatible with competitive games. Ooh. Now what I mean by that is Warhammer 40k tournaments where the purpose is to uh rank and place are fundamentally stupid. <laughs> Unpopular. <laughs> yeah. But... I suppose it depends. Um, obviously, like gridded games or hexa hexagonal boards are like more accurate. Like and, human and error exactly, is definitely a thing. That's exactly what it comes down to. So yeah. I think so many games hinge on these models are eight inches away from each other. I rolled an eight inch mm -hmm. charge. Does the charge go off? No, that's slightly more than eight inches away. No, that's slightly less than eight inches right. away. <clears throat> and you either need to, you know, have a judge adjudicate stuff like that, or mm -hmm. it always comes down to the, uh, you know, so-called gentleman's agreement of right. essentially negotiating or arguing or asserting or lying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and whatever works, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, so I feel like so much of these games comes down to, you know, maybe slightly cheating with the measuring stick or, uh, you know, negotiating whether we're going to say this charge goes off or, are you know, depending on the addition, are these models in heavy cover or soft cover? Do I have line of sight to this? Mm -hmm. uh, does this weird nub on the far corner of the weapon count as line of sight? Does this elbow count as light of sight? Um, yeah. And so many of these things are, you know, kind of agreed upon, and it's not a grid. There are not hard rules. I mean, it's like, you know, a chess tournament where you're arguing about whether a pawn can move, you know, <laughs> 2.1 squares or, you know, whatever it is. Right, yeah. <laughs> um, it doesn't. It, it doesn't work. It doesn't make sense for a competitive game. Like, um, and especially if you know that on turn three, charge distance is going to be a really big deal. On turn one, yeah. when you're moving your orcs forward, are you moving them slightly farther than five inches or whatever they're supposed to move? Um, you know, are you playing super conservative and moving them slightly less than they're allowed to move? but then you're feeling really bad about it. Like, oh man, I'm, <laughs> I'm not maximizing my orcs. Um, I don't know. I just think that the fact that it's not on a grid adds so much mushiness to it that needs to be decided with like weird social interactions. Of... Which, yeah, we're not all exactly uh, attuned to social interaction so yeah I, I can definitely see how in a competitive setting that could be an issue i mean i've seen it so yeah right and again it, because you know that charge on turn three or turn four might be really important you know how closely do you need to be watching your opponent measure on turn one and turn two movement how closely do you need to be you know measuring on your turn one and turn two movement and it's not that it's not you know of course it is possible to precisely measure all 30 of your boys in that squ squad um, right but that's not fun mm -hmm. <laughs> so it, it turns into a situation where just like adjudicating the game becomes fraught with really uncomfortable uh, mm -hmm. you know types of interactions right both socially and Either, either you are spending so much time doing precise measurements on all your units or you are compensating for that with uh, loose social arrangements of a competitive nerd who's trying to win. And Right. Yeah. That's a tough one because um, I, I totally agree with you. Um, but at the same time, it's like I would almost say that that measuring is incompatible because it is too perfect because it is exact, right? If you can measure it exactly, which you can't really do ever, 
Well, that's the situation. Yeah, like just the the act of trying to measure the distance between two bases, it's really hard mm -hmm. to get your measuring tape actually touching the two yeah. points you need it to be touching, you know? Um, yeah, exactly. And I mean, you can... I, I think they've... I think they've kind of taken care of it a little, a little bit where they say, okay, you need an eight inch charge as long as it's seven and a half inches. It's it. There's like, they give you that wiggle room right at the last half inch. Like that's, I think they've tried to yeah, mitigate but even, these problems. But even then, like you, you'll have arguments over seven and a half inches instead of eight inches. Right. Now. Like it, that's the yeah. that's the issue um but on the other hand like for a friendly game where it, the purpose is just for you know a couple of folks to have fun playing a game i think that mm -hmm. wiggle room actually adds to it like if if one player yeah. is ahead and they want to like handicap themselves a little bit they could be like oh man the, that charge didn't quite go off for me like you you're gonna get an extra turn of shooting at my work lads uh um, yeah or or be like, oh yeah, you guys, you guys are definitely in cover there. Yeah, I, yeah, I see it. Look, um, mm -hmm. and so for for players who are interested in having a good time and telling a story and hanging out with each other, that mushiness, if you kind of play it the other way to to make sure that the game is a little bit more even, I think that can be a good thing. And of course, the the main advantage of the measuring stick is that you can. Um, use any terrain that you want uh, you can set mm -hmm. up the board any way that you want the the fact that it's uh, you know kind of has those looser rules in that respect means that there's a lot of customization in terms of what the game looks like and I think that's cool but yeah in terms of a tournament setting that sounds so brutal to me like having to be well alert for 12 hours at a tournament to make sure that your <laughs> opponent isn't moving an extra half inch on turn one. That just sounds so yeah. brutal. Like, yeah. I guess you have to be that kind of person. I would, I would say though that um, bringing up my earlier unpopular opinion about skirmish games, just being better like war cry, right? You're talking maybe 10 models at the most. So when you're talking about measuring mm -hmm. closely, and paying attention that feels like you are actually making choices because it's a compressed size right so if i'm going to move something and i'm going to be two and a half inches away from you then i'm most definitely two and a half inches away from you and we both know that right like you're not moving 30 boys at the same time you're moving one or two right and so that it, helps it, a it lot definitely yeah yeah yeah, the, so the like strategy that. of, you know, you move the first boy out of 30 and then you just kind of move the other 29 basically behind the yeah. first one. <laughs> yeah. uh, again, that stresses me out because I feel like I'm either accidentally cheating or accidentally cheating myself. Sure. Um, or, you know, the opponent is doing that and I've, you know, stressed out, like trying to see if they're you know, getting an extra couple of inches on the boy in the back or, or whatever. Uh, yeah, yeah. But I've definitely I can, felt that, so I, I know what you mean. Yeah, making, you know, five measurements per turn instead of 100 measurements per turn sounds a lot better, yeah. I'd agree with yeah, that. Yeah. And like you were saying, with uh, Underworlds, just having hexes, this character mm -hmm. moves three hexes. I have moved yeah. three hexes. There's, there's no argument there. You, you yeah. Get, <laughs> <laughs> the person says, wow, you flanked me. I didn't see that. Or, uh, yeah. 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 They're not, you're not having to deal with that. Although I, so I used to play hero clicks a lot. Um, like so much that uh, a friend and I would go down to a store all the time and they'd have tournaments and stuff. So we'd play, um, we went down one weekend and like there were, you know, 12 ish people there or something like that. And, uh, yeah, even those arguments, like even on a gridded game, like line of sight especially was a huge thing. Um, it was it still felt awkward, like just playing it competitively, even on a grid was there were still arguments. Well, you can't okay. do that. You can't move over here, you know, whatever, whatever. So I don't 
I don't know if measurement is necessarily a thing or if it's just people's attitude in general in competitive play. Yeah. Yeah, it, that situation with the, the 30 orc lads, though, like, you oh, know real. that they're not yeah. being precisely <laughs> measured. Um, yeah. you know, a game like X-Wing or something that it's it's designed, there's like a system for exactly how to do the measurements. Um, yeah, right, yeah, pre Yeah, there's, there's a uh, ruler templates. stick that you're supposed to touch on each side, and like, mm -hmm. I feel a little bit better about that other than... Right here's a, a measuring tape that you don't want to clunk any of your orcs with, so you don't actually put it too close to them. But you got to move thirty of right. them, and don't take too long. Uh, <sighs> Movement trays. Well, there you go. That's uh, that solves one of the problems. But you know, man, the <laughs> arguing nerds yeah. is just always a sore spot. It's it's never fun. And yeah. it seems like competitive measuring sticks over the course of 12 hours just sounds like such a brutal thing. And I, I don't know, like, is it at, at kind of a low level tournament is just like a way to meet new people and, and get some games mm -hmm. in. I see the appeal, but if you're actually trying to get to the, uh, the top tables, Oh, that does not sound like fun. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But. All right, hit me with something unpopular, Casey. All right, let's do this. Um, games Workshop pricing doesn't bother me. That's unpopular. You're wrong. Probably that's because you're wrong. That's... It's because it doesn't bother me at all. I don't care. Company is company. Price is price. I want thing. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. I mean, um, and that's coming from me. Like, I, I purposely go on eBay to not pay their prices, <laughs> right? <laughs> that's actually true. You just feel better about yourself the more expensive something is. You're happy when something gets a price raise because that means you got your, uh, you got your Giselle team for... <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's yeah what you're, I'm talking. You're, you're rattling gunners for only 20% of the MSRP. You're, you're happy exactly. when that MSRP goes up, yeah. Yes. Now, uh, I think the the biggest reason it doesn't bother me is because like I've been in and around small business for a long time. Um I understand the type of work that goes into something and like you're not necessarily pricing things based on like well, you know, to produce a plastic kit it only costs a dollar ninety five in plastic. It's like no, there's there's a value put on that. Like, what are people willing to pay? And I think that's valid. I I think it's fine. Uh, value based pricing is something that keeps a lot of people in business. You know, it's feeding a lot of those families. It's keeping those sculptors employed. And like, yeah, they're making a lot of money. But you know what? I get to still buy models, and I'm I'm fine with that. Like. You know, if it if it jumps out of my price range at some point, then I can, you know, continue to do what I'm doing on eBay and find deals like that's not going to go away. The secondhand market is definitely not going to go away. And Brent needs to buy a 50 gallon tank today. Yeah. I don't know if you kept going with the conversation or not. I had to let Gordon into the room. <laughs> I did. I did. But uh, obviously Brent just got up and then came back. So everyone else will get it. You're fine. So well, what's your Well, I was prepared to unpopular? disagree with anything you said. So oh, I, I will raise the point of Imperial Guardsmen. Now, when I got mm -hmm. into the hobby, they were $20 for 20 Guardsmen. And right now gotcha. they are $35, $40 for 10 Guardsmen. And they're the same Guardsmen. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm not going to disagree that that kit needs an upgrade, an update, if you will. But do you want those guardsmen? The thing is, I can't forget what I paid for my first box of guardsmen. <laughs> um, and something deep within me says quadrupling the price should come up, should come with a uh, a modernized kit. Yeah, it should. Yeah, I'm not. I'm. I'm certainly not going to argue that. I think. Weirdly, I was actually just having this conversation with someone today um, 
about how a lot of the older pewter guardsmen just look better. There's more variety. They're, they're, you know, it's more character in the older sculpts, right? Um, and that plastic kit has not been updated in 25 years. Yeah. Whatever. Yeah, Long I feel time. you've also angered a lot yeah. of Australians too. So, um, with with GW, I mean, it's a it's a luxury item. It's an item that, yeah, clearly the value is not based on the material cost of the plastic. Polystyrene is not expensive material. Um, mm. But it's the price increases, I think, that get me. Like, I can, sure. I can get used to, okay, this uh, price increases that are not increasing corresponding to inflation, you know? Sure, they're, um, they're going above and beyond, yeah. Yeah, the... You know, every year GW says, like, we're increasing prices again because there have been some kits that have, it's been a little while since we've increased the prices on them. Like, the that's literally what they say in their, uh, mm -hmm. in their at least yearly notification that some stuff is going up in price. Like, oh, it's been a while since we, inc we, we uh, hiked up the price on this. So, uh, time to hike that on up. Uh, sure. It's not going to hike itself, you know? So, let's, uh, <laughs> Let's get into that spreadsheet and hit the up button a few times, you know? Yeah. But like you mentioned before, if I find if I find a Giselle for five bucks and they're twenty five bucks now, I just made twenty bucks. There you go. Last week I only made fifteen bucks. So this is I mean it's really motivation to buy now. Buy now and hoard. That's the I mean that's that's true, and I think that's part of their their game plan. They want you to buy the things that you want to buy as soon as possible so that you don't necessarily get screwed over. I don't think that's entirely their, their intent. Um, it works for them though. I mean, they are very good at creating <laughs> demand for their products. Yeah. Like the, I need to have it now, the fear of missing out the, um, the limited edition stuff on its own is like an insanely good strategy right that uh, i don't know i i think it just comes down to like if i'm going to be in this hobby and i'm going to play this particular game and i want to buy games workshop yeah. then whatever they're going to do is whatever they're going to do like i don't think they're ever going to go so far as to um damage their their core audience like they're going to hike prices and they're going to lose people here and there. But overwhelmingly, they've also put out box sets and kits that are less expensive to get around some of that, right? To get into Warhammer is easier than it was 20 years ago. And it was cheaper 20 years ago. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, as a painter... You know, I, I am getting my money's worth on, on almost any model. Like the number of hours I put into painting a model based on what I paid for the model, it's normally a perfectly fine from that point of view. Um, right. If you're thinking of putting together a, a two thousand point army and you're just planning on spray painting it, yeah, then I can. Right. Yeah. Um. And of course. You know, all of this varies based on what country you live in. And I know that yeah. you know, Australia, uh, yeah. you're going to have some people disagreeing with you there, I think, Casey. Well, let me let me sort of fix that. Like, no matter what, even if they were as cheap as they were, if if those Cadians were as cheap as they were 25 years ago, Australia would still be like, sorry, they're twice the price. Mm -hmm. Like, it still sucks. And that's whatever that trade agreement is like that sort of has to do with games workshop and England and, you know, export import costs and VAT and all this crap. But it's like, that's, I don't know. I don't know how else you can get around that. I mean, okay. I kind of do when people have <laughs> like, I've been commissioned, I think more from people in Australia than anyone else. I've done more commissions for people who live in Australia. And I'm pretty sure it's because they don't have to pay that extra cost. If I have the model, then I ship it to them. It's cheaper than if mm. they bought it. It's the same price to buy painted, huh? 
I would imagine actually it's probably not far <laughs> off. <laughs> right. So yeah, like, uh, even just ordering from someone else, you know, on eBay, I, I don't think that they charge extra. I could be wrong about that, but I've never seen an extra charge on, on like imports or me having to pay some fee or something or them having to for receiving a package on eBay. Hmm. So, I mean, that, that might be the answer anyway. Somebody might need to correct me on that. I have no idea what the case is in, in that situation. Yeah. yeah, I'd say on this topic, I, I definitely get flashes of anger or incredulity sometimes when I see GW prices. <laughs> the uh, the new Giants kit for, for Age of Sigmar <laughs> was like it's a giant model. It's yeah. a... It's a model of a, a big hairy man or something, and it, what, one hundred and eighty dollars. I mean, it's it's goofy. One sixty five, right? yeah. Well, okay, that was on eBay. I don't know what it is for retail. <laughs> it's uh, it's extreme, but it, it um, is quite. Yeah, it's one of those that you look at, it, you just shake your but, head. Okay, and, yeah. so so, but at least let it's me a new put model. it to you this way, though. Well, yeah, it's a new model, and I'm glad that they they did that. But check this out, right? When we talked about value based pricing. Okay, how much do you think it costs to buy a two thousand point army generally? Right, five hundred bucks. No, I, I, I'd see right? that argument, but uh, that's why they're still. doing it. I know, but that's why they're doing it. Still, when you get the one box and down in the little bottom corner it says contains one model, and uh, well, there was that joke forever ago that was like, uh, you know. Ail Gusler Gargant start collecting and it's like this whole thing and it's got the number one down in the corner. Right, right. Turns out to be true. <laughs> of course. And like of course. Twice the price of a normal start collecting box, yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, really that joke is yeah, half of a gargant. Yeah. Um, yeah, right. <laughs> I don't know. I mean it's it's one of those things like I, I did immediately put notifications on eBay for bits from that box and i have it's so close to buying it's literally the rest of the kit without the main body and like one head option or whatever and it's for like 40 bucks okay oh that's gonna be a glorious day casey think about it a glorious video yeah where you just put a nasty clump of clay in between a bunch of arms <laughs> and target yeah, heads exactly too. i'm i'm so into that well i mean okay Lost Adventures Volume 2. Danny and I actually talked about something like that. There is a Gargant. There's a giant in that 3D printable Kickstarter. Yeah. And I was like, you know, dude, like, I don't want to cut up your models, but <laughs> he's like, oh, you can go for it. But I mean, right there. Okay. 3D print the body. Cost me four bucks. $44 for uh, two extra kit kits, basically replace the the arms the head the feet whatever you got three hundred dollars almost four hundred dollars in giants for 50 bucks games workshop prices don't bother me well if you're not going to buy the product like <laughs> <laughs> Casey, okay, you just explained instance. like yeah, yeah. i know <laughs> Days long process for avoiding paying GW prices. <laughs> well, you're right, but uh, you view the them other... as so heinous that they're they're a challenge. Like that's the, the... <laughs> yeah, that's why it doesn't bother me. I just feel so good. <laughs> they don't bother me because I don't pay them. Like that's that's a valid <laughs> yeah, answer, I, I suppose. Care less. Yeah, I don't All know. Right. It just it it just is what it is. Yeah. All right, I've got another actual unpopular opinion here. <clears throat> this might be the most unpopular opinion. Yeah. There should not be conventions in 2021. COVID is not over. There is no vaccine on the market. No one has it in their veins. Even once they do, people are going to do stupid stuff. Especially once <laughs> some people have vaccine in the veins, they're going to do stupid stuff. Now, yeah. if you are thinking about whether to go to a convention in 2021, um... You can make that choice now. Uh, like, I know that I was planning on going to a couple of conventions in 2020, and I felt a lot better after we had affirmatively made the decision not to go. So when Adepticon was canceled, um, yeah, it was disappointing. But on the other hand, it was clearly the correct decision. 
And once the, uh, you know, convention runners had made that decision, I felt relief. That was the emotion I felt because I no longer had to decide whether to go and put my friends and family at risk um, or to, you know, go and to somehow through a butterfly effect um, cause somebody else to become infected by, you know, putting another person in the hall and making everybody stand an extra inch closer to each other and causing someone on the other hall to, to get infected. Like, um, there was an immense sense of relief having known that there was no chance of that happening because the convention was canceled. Now, later this same year, um, when it came time to go to Gen Con, which is a early August convention, um, the runners of that convention took a long time again to decide to cancel it. And this time around, my friends and I, our room group said, you know what, we're just not going. It is clearly a risk going to an airport, going to a convention hall, spending uh, four days in a hotel room with four other adults, and then spending the rest of the time crowded into, uh, you know, halls and restaurants is clearly a bad idea. It is clearly a risk that is not justified at all by the benefit. Um, and so we decided, you know, it, earlier in 2020 to not go to Gen Con 2020. And that was a massive relief to have that decision made and, and behind us. We didn't need to, you know, be stressing about whether or not to actually buy plane tickets or anything like that. Uh, just no, we're not going this year. Now, we are recording this episode in uh, November, late November of 2020. 2021 is right around the corner. We all told ourselves that we're going to conventions in 2021, and we're going to make up for lost time, and we're going to get an extra day off of work this year, and we're going to spend more money in the vendor hall this year, and spend more time with our friends this year. Um, COVID is worse than ever right now. Uh, especially in the first half of 2021, this is not happening. Do not plan on this happening. In the first half of 2021, you should not go to conventions. Uh, the second half of 2021, maybe. Um, I maintain that, you know, <laughs> I, I'm pretty sure that once a vaccine is out, people are going to be stupid and there is going to be another spike. Like, I, uh, I can't see that not happening, honestly. Um, so my unpopular opinion is you have the choice to decide right now to not go to conventions in 2021. That is the correct choice. You will feel better once you make it, make it. Um, I have Casey. <laughs> in all honesty, I think that they're probably going to make that decision for us regardless. See, I'm, I'm not sure, especially like later in the year. I think that people running conventions, they have fiduciary responsibility. They, I mean, they have a really tough decision to make. Sure. But I think there's so much momentum on some of these things. You know, um, something like Gen Con, you can look up when the dates for Gen Con are in 2025 or 2026. Like they, they book these right, things out yeah. years in advance. Um and there's, there's a ton of planning and a ton of investment that goes into these things. And there's, you know, so much momentum there that I think there's going to be a lot of pressure on, on people running conventions to say, uh, free masks at the door and honor system mm -hmm. that you got the vaccine before you came or honor system yeah. that you're going to wear a mask. Um, I suppose it depends. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> now see, I live, I live in Nevada. We have casinos here. Uh, everything else has been barely shut down. Like we're mostly open at this point, although, you know, things are changing literally right now. Um, but casinos. Yeah. Free masks at the door. Six feet. What's that? Yeah. So I don't know what they're going to do. Yeah. Um, Man, it just, just I'm thinking about a convention, like, you know, four days of not, okay, so, so my point is not only is it not safe, it is not safe, um, mm -hmm. you are putting yourself and others at risk, and by others, I mean, like, the 
the roommate of the brother of your coworker, you know, like, um, you, you are putting others at risk for the purpose of, of having fun and blowing off steam and, and getting some mental health relief probably, um, at this point. Yeah. But it's not going to be fun. There, people are going to be on edge, Mm -hmm. more stressed out than normal. Um, I mean, already a convention, like, people are normally just barely not snapping most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> right. Because, uh, I mean, it's, you know, 16 hours a day of, of having as much fun as you can. And, you know, let's face it, out of shape people walking around all day. And, like, people are, are this close to snapping all the time at conventions or, or like, within within a friend group. There's normally one person that's, like, at the end of their of their <laughs> you know, rope or whatever you want to call it at all times. Oh, yeah. Um, but, but we, you know, there's, there's kind of an equilibrium there and on the whole, everyone's having fun. But if you add this huge layer of stress to absolutely everyone in the hall that they need to be on their guard and need to be careful and need to constantly not be too close to people and need to, you know, not hug their friends. Um, that's not going to be fun. Uh, there's, you know, some of the people you want to see won't be there. The people you want to see uh, who are there will be wearing a mask and will be standoffish and you won't be getting selfies with anyone. Mm. Um, right. <laughs> and I mean, I'm just like imagining, you know, you sit down to play uh, a one shot D&D game and there's four people at the table and it's a big table and everyone's spaced out. And then three other folks come by and say, our, our DM canceled, can we join your game? And then three more people sit around the table, like, that's going to happen. Stuff like that's going to be happening all day for the entire convention. It's not going to be safe. Yeah. You're going to be stressed the whole time. It's not going to be fun. Um, at least in the first half of 2021, this isn't happening. Do yourself a favor and cross it off your list now. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think that's just the the safest way to go about it. And just assume that just just pretend like they're not even happening, even if they are at this point. Yeah, Um, because I think you're right. Like, like, even if. You know, we get a vaccine and it's like, oh, Adepticons two weeks after, you know, vaccines are in place. It's like, yeah, it's still going to be weird and it's not going to be normal and it's not going to be what you want it to be regardless. You know, like, I, I don't know what's going to happen after the vaccine. But I have a feeling that, like, masks are probably going to be mandatory for a while. You know, it's just going to be a thing. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, we don't know at this point, like, we're recording this. There's been good news recently about uh, progress of vaccine development and, Pfizer mm -hmm. and Moderna have both released reports that say the vaccine they're working on has been testing really well. And so mm -hmm. we have reason to be optimistic for the future. Um, yeah. So hang in there for another six months, eight months, a year, whatever it is. Uh, make it through this period. 2022, I've got a real good feeling about. Uh, but 2021 is at least yeah. the first half is going to be uh similarly bad to 2020 i think at least in terms of a virus so yeah well and and as a slight consolation if you will like if you're really really wanting to go and you want to get out and you want to meet up with those friends and those people like start scheduling like you know monthly hangouts on you know on discord on whatever to just sit and paint or you know play D D or whatever do something because we still need that social interaction. And like I, I've said before, like if I wasn't in a group, uh, like if I wasn't in a discord with other people in my position on YouTube and painting miniatures and doing this stuff, I would have quit a long time ago. And I, I think it's kind of the same thing. Like if you're not hanging out with people and especially in such a social game, like, like the ones that we generally play, like that's pretty damaging, you know, to your mental health and just overall well-being. So whatever you can do, like have a convention digitally. They they did that last year, basically yeah. the online conventions. I thought that was a really cool alternative. And if anything, they're going to do that in conjunction with a real convention. You know, 
So it's still possible to do the things and to be with people and, you know, not die. Yeah. Um, My suggestion, instead of like waiting and playing it by ear and am I going to go or am I not going to go or, you know, are my friends going to go to the convention? Is it even going to be open? Make the decision now. I'm not going to go to the convention. It's not happening this year, Mm -hmm. but I am going to find a replacement activities i'm going to find virtual conventions i'm going to set up calls with my friends I'm going to have you know painting hangouts going to join a virtual D game whatever um uh, yeah my thoughts on this are be proactive say okay look <laughs> based on the example of 2020 if there's no vaccine uh conventions are not happening in 2021 and even if they are happening they're not going to be fun they're not going to be safe they're not worth going to make the decision yeah. not going in person but i'm going to find ways to uh stay sane stay healthy stay happy uh, by talking to to friends and, and making new ones on the old yeah. internet yeah yeah oh, that was a real downer <laughs> Uh, look get yourself a fish uh like <laughs> it better have a big enough tank though yeah it's better have even, a big enough tank because there. if that fish dies before you're out of quarantine that's gonna be a real bad feeling so uh make, you know get yourself a fish but take care of that fish uh mm-hmm. yeah. or better yet like get a bird yeah i got a bird Casey used to work at a bird store. <laughs> That's not true. I I never I never did. <laughs> Imagine if actually you when I was into an hour conversation on proper <laughs> bird care. <laughs> yeah, to avoid feather rot, you need to mix a little bit of lavender in with your spritzer bottle. You know what I'm saying? From about two feet away, just above, bird's gonna really like that. I have no idea. Don't do that to your animal. I, I don't know if that would hurt your animal or not. Um, though I did buy a fish. Well, I, squirt, I squirt my cats when they're hanging out on top of the fish tank. Like, I mean, that's, that's, that's just good call. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Good practice. Dude, Snuffles has been jumping up on Bubbles' tank recently, and it is <laughs> frightening. Like, yeah. yeah if, oh, man. If, if proper care of Bubbles results in, like, electrocuting Snuffles, <laughs> man... I'm going to respond to every one of those comments on that video. I swear to God. Yeah. (laughs) Right. Like this wouldn't happen. Wouldn't happen. Yeah. (laughs) Oh man. Casey, do you want to, do you want to do one more unpopular opinion? One more, one more. All right. One more. All right. This is the last one. Uh, Make it a good one, Casey. It's, it's all right. It's, it's all right. You need italicized, bold, circled, underlined, and airbrush. You need it. Can't live without it. So you just took a cheap hobby to get into and made it expensive. You just told I me don't I care about a 20-gallon airbrush. <laughs> yeah, kind of. I mean, I started with a, a cheapo one, and that was, yeah, that was awesome. Like, I think I got a little lucky, you know, (laughs) I've heard, I've heard some horror stories, but like, yeah, that $20 master airbrush that I bought, that thing still works great. Like still, it's been like three years and I use an airbrush. I mean, I use that one for like probably a good solid year every single day. Um, now I don't think you necessarily should just straight up buy a $20 airbrush, but I think you do need an airbrush. I think it should be a tool on your bench. And I think, yeah, you, you just should have one. Like there are just so many things that you can do. You know, if you want to paint an entire army, like we talked about speed painting last week, like you want to actually get work done. You want to finish projects. Kind of need an airbrush in like 99% of cases. It's a useful tool. Can't argue with that. Yeah. It's a useful tool. Um, I mean, in my videos, I actually try to restrain my airbrush use because I try I to make it, uh, you know, uh, applicable to somebody who's not willing to dedicate, 
the the space and the money to to using an mm-hmm. airbrush because I mean it it is an investment it is mm-hmm. um you know it, it does take what can be fifty dollars setup cost for for getting some paints and brushes and minis and turns it into certainly well over a hundred probably over two hundred um mm-hmm. We've already established that one giant in a box is almost two hundred dollars. <laughs> to be fair, I bet you could paint a giant really well with an airbrush. <laughs> and if you're already buying I mean, a giant, large, might as well. Yeah. yeah. If you buy a giant yeah. before you buy an airbrush, now here's uh, there's an interesting talk. Like, at what yeah, point true. do you buy an airbrush? Well, this is kind of the angle I was thinking, right? Like, um, I know that you definitely try and stay away from the airbrush or at least talk about our alternatives when you do use it and say that, you know, you could absolutely do this here and here. And this is kind of how you would do that. I do think that if you use your airbrush more often, especially when making videos that your actual painting skill would improve quicker. I think that there is a threshold, a certain amount of time, perhaps that you've been in the hobby or a certain model, you know, in the case of that giant where You know, it's time to step up your game. Like if you if you're serious about painting, you want to be in this hobby. I think you should absolutely get an airbrush. I mean, even some of the absolute best painters in the world. Like they're using an airbrush, too, and it might not be for, you know, obviously like the super fine detail brushwork that that gets them that last 10 percent. But like they're utilizing a tool to make it a lot easier on themselves and to do really cool things that would just be a lot harder with a paintbrush. Mm. No, I'm with you. I yeah. I like the point of, you know, buy an airbrush before you buy a giant. I think that's sure. I think that's accurate. Yeah. Yeah. Now that also being said though, um uh John Ninas from Trapped Under Plastic just put out a video talking about that you don't need an airbrush to paint large models. I mean, large paintbrushes exist. Sure. Oh, yeah. I mean, his his is more like uh, using oil paints and some other things and to to make it a lot easier on yourself. Um, I mean, he did a lot of cool stuff in there, but, you know. I I haven't watched that particular video yet, but that's the second video that John has put out with Danny's minis. Now... Right. So uh, a, a couple of us have been putting out uh, videos that, you know, we're for painting something, might as well paint minis from one of our friends, you know, Danny, the 3D printing DM, 3D uh, printed tabletop. You know, it's got a Kickstarter going, might as well help our friend out. And, you know, John now has put out two presumably great videos about uh, yeah. painting minis for that that Kickstarter and I put out one video to help out Danny, and it ended up uh, it violating PETA <laughs> guidelines. And uh, right, man, that video, I tell you, like uh, I checked the statistics, and uh, the YouTube recommendations for that video have dropped to basically nothing. All of the views from yeah. that video are now coming from external. So somebody linking it and somebody clicking <laughs> on that link. And it's you like, need to see this guy. No, it's a <laughs> lot of views. Like it is more views from external than I have ever gotten on a video before. And I think interesting. I think that some of them are coming from Danny's Kickstarter page because he did. Oh, that's post actually it. a good point. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But it's like he probably threw it it's, on there. it's like a hundred an hour. It's it's like a lot of views coming in from external sources, and yeah, I haven't been lot. getting the the spikes from external. Haven't necessarily been spiking with uh, comments calling me a knob. Um, I hit that guy. <laughs> you, if you come back multiple times to the same video to call me a knob, I, you you just gotta get banned. That's just the way it is. But oh um, yeah, hundred percent. If you're yeah. if you're watching now, Speedman Twelve, um, just know that you can type stuff into the the comment section, and it will appear on your page that you commented. Mm-hmm. But nobody else in the world will see that comment because you've been hidden. Um, yeah. But if you you know Speedman Twelve, if you don't bother to listen to uh, Paint Bravely the podcast, you won't know that I used to work at Aquatic Concepts in the years uh, what two thousand three to two thousand five. You won't know that. Uh, 
you mm -hmm. won't know that you can't mm -hmm. comment on my videos anymore. You'll keep on calling me a knob every day and uh, no one will see it, but you'll know it's there. It's fine. And I'll probably know well, it's there too. The best part about that too is that it still boosts your video just a little bit because somebody commented. Oh yeah. I mean, this guy, he keeps clicking on the video to call me a knob. I mean, it's not great for mm -hmm. watch time because he's probably not there for, you know, the full 15 minute one video. One guy but... though, one guy, you know. Yeah. Oh, 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 speed man 12. Speed man 12. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, that was a lot of unpopular opinions. Yeah, we're going to try to make the next one better. We don't know what our topic is for next time. But if you have ideas for topics for future episodes of Paint Bravely, the podcast, please go to the YouTube channel and uh, leave a comment, ask some questions, um, recognize that we purposely talked about things today that were unpopular. We know they're unpopular. You do. Yeah, they are. I mean, you can I mean, let us start. know. You can let us know. But yeah. we know. We know. Yeah. Uh, you know, let us know the most you'd be willing to pay for a guardsman or a gargant or a giant. Uh, you know, let, let us know. Do you have an airbrush? Do you have a fish? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. But do suggest topic ideas for better episodes of Paint Bravely, the podcast, and we'll we'll give it some serious consideration. I mean, we'll try. No, oh, for sure. Like, yeah. Believe it or We're not, we're to... trying now. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. I mean, we. it's not like we're not trying look, i think look east coast time it is two in the morning right now um but i'm actually not that tired because my sleep schedule is all messed up because of galactic civilizations three which kept me up till oh, like yeah. six a couple nights ago so um <laughs> man I, we can I keep used going to play, uh, yeah. i used to play oh what is it it's not city of heroes it's the, the superhero one dc universe online right that came out I got like way too into that game, like way, way, way too into it. Um, yeah. And like uh, they have a server shut off for a while, like every night at four in the morning. And like I would basically just play until that server shut off every single day. It was real unhealthy. <laughs> but like yeah. if they didn't shut the servers down for maintenance every day for like 20 minutes, I would probably still been playing. Yeah. I'm glad they did. Me too. Saved a lot of lives. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's probable. Yeah. Yeah. World of Warcraft. Whew. Well, every Tuesday. Right. That's one day a week. Yeah. That's not, that's not enough. Sleep. I mean, you can spend that, uh, that server downtime, like, angrily checking <laughs> forms and stuff. I think that's... <laughs> Yeah. Commonly done. But... <laughs> <laughs> it's true. <laughs> oh, man. All right. We're running out of, we're starting to veer into like popular opinions here. So we better shut this That's down. That's a good Casey. point. That's a very good point. Um, unpopular opinion, though. Final Fantasy 11 online, better than World of Warcraft. And on that note, thank you again for joining us on another episode of Paint Bravely. If you enjoyed this episode, please help us out by leaving us a review on iTunes subscribing to the YouTube channel, and sharing this message with your hobby friends. As always, we appreciate each and every one of you for listening. So long, and thanks for all the fish. So long, and thanks for all the fish. Restaurant at the end of the universe. Mm -hmm. Mostly harmless. Last book in that series. Way better than the first